Good morning. Welcome back to Metropolitan Community College's Women's History Month programming. I welcome our virtual audience and thank the technicians for making today's presentation possible. March is dedicated as Women's History Month, set aside to honor women's contributions in American history. Women's history began as a local celebration in Santa Rosa, California, where Women's History Week was celebrated in 1978. The week of March 8th was selected to correspond with International Women's Day. Then in February 1980, President Jimmy Carter issued the first presidential proclamation stating, from the first settlers who came to our shores, from the first American Indian families who befriended them, men and women have worked together to build this nation. Too often the women were unsung and their contributions went unnoticed, but the achievements, leadership, courage, strength, and love of the women who built America was as vital as that of the men whose names we know so well. Today, we're honored to have a native Nebraskan who developed her career into global recognition, who will be sharing her experiences with us. And we are indebted to Teresa Foley, MCC's Assistant to International Intercultural Education, for introducing us to the possibility of hearing from Mary Lou Luther. Teresa, thank you again for always keeping your eyes open for potential presenters. And Teresa is now going to introduce today's speaker. Good morning. My name is Teresa Foley and I'm Barbara's assistant. And I first became of Mary Lou on a PBS short. It was a wonderful short, it gave a little history about her um, and that she was from Cambridge, Nebraska. And I, I thought how wonderful that she made it you know, so, you know, became so involved in fashion, kind of almost like an accident. So she resides in uh, New York, making her mark in Los Angeles. And, and like I said, hailing from Cambridge, Nebraska, Mary Lou Luther is a fashion industry legend. She had little exposure to fashion when she began her career at the Lincoln Journal and the Des Moines Register. Fast forward 40 years and she became the creative director of Fashion Group International Editor of the International Fashion Syndicate, CFDA Award winner, syndicated clothesline columnist, and more. Mary Lou's biannual ready-to-wear trend report for FGI, narrated in her signature authoritative, sophisticated voice, sets the seasonal tone with her much-anticipated summaries. It's no wonder her trend reports are followed by industry professionals in 28-plus regions all over the world. So I want to welcome Mary Lou. Thank you. I'm, I'm delighted to be here. Thank you, Mary Lou. Um, we are so happy to have you. You told us that anybody from Nebraska or reconnecting with Nebraska is important to you. Can yes. you tell us a little bit about um, where you grew up? And Sydney's going to put up a map so we can see where your home of Cambridge is. Okay, sure. I grew up in I, the population when I was there uh, was 1,203. And uh, as I once, they asked me once to give a speech to the graduating class uh, at Cambridge. And I, my subject was the power of nice. And I talked about how in a small town, you have to be nice, because if you're not, there, someone is going to tell your parents, or someone's going to tell your teacher, or someone's going to tell your best friend. So there is a niceness about Cambridge that is forever attractive. Thank you. Thank you. So I, for one, was not familiar with Cambridge, and I like to get it a view and I can see Victoria Lapo, geography instructor on. She probably wants to see a map, right, Victoria? There it is. All right. Thank you, Sydney. That's we just needed a little view of where Cambridge was. So I always, can, go ahead. I, I, I always tell people that it's halfway between Omaha and Denver. I, I'm sure that's pretty accurate. All right. 
Okay. So from Cambridge, you went to the University of Nebraska. Yes. Tell us about, um, you studied journalism and tell us about how your journalism career got started, please. Okay. Uh, it was graduation time. And one uh, of my favorite teachers, name was Bill Heiss, uh, said to me, you know, um, you're going to start work the day after graduation at the Lincoln Journal. <laughs> he taught there in the evenings, too. Anyway, I said, well, no, I'm not. I'm going home to Cambridge. I've worked really hard, and I, I don't want to start work the day after graduation. And he said, well, you're going to. And I did. And my first job, and it taught me a, a nice lesson. My first job was for a woman, Helen Haggy, and it was to move her car every two hours. I mean, that wasn't the only thing I did, but that was the most crucial thing for her. And I never for a moment thought that was above me, uh, below me, anywhere but me. So <clears throat> I soon figured out that uh, the police would come along with a long stick uh, with chalk on it and mark the tire every two hours, or I think that was how long. But anyway, so I soon learned to put to erase the chalk. So they didn't, they thought the car was there, you know, legitimately. And uh, I, I'm telling you this story only because with today's young women, especially, if some boss asked them to do that, they would either say, well, that's not in my job description, or they probably turn him or her into some authority that they were being mistreated. You know, it, it just doesn't happen like that anymore. <laughs> I can tell a, another it doesn't happen like that anymore. Can I tell it? Oh, please do. Okay. I was working at the Chicago Tribune and uh, um, Christian Dior came to Marshall Fields for a personal appearance. It was uh, the, it was 19, his his big collection with, called the New Look was 1947. So this was 10 year anniversary, 1957. And uh, he was totally charming and wonderful. And my boss, Eleanor Nangle, uh, said, you know, he's so great. And tomorrow morning, I know that uh, there's going to be a big show. So I think maybe we should stay all night uh, in a hotel because you know we want to be sure that we're there on time. So I got deathly sick in the middle of the night. I have no idea. I, did, I had nothing to drink. I, I think it was an allergy to shrimp. But anyway, I spent the evening, the night, up checking. So the next morning, my, I thought, oh, my God, can you believe you'd be sharing a bedroom with your boss and you are vomiting all night long? So she looked at me and she said, well, here you look bright eyed and bushy tailed and I haven't slept a wink. And I thought, oh, my gosh, she's going to fire me, you know. Well, not only did she not fire me, but Dior died that year within a, uh, within months of his appearance in Chicago. And uh, it was announced that he was going to be replaced by a 21 year old Yves Saint Laurent. And uh, the whole fashion world, of course, was eager. And uh, so I asked Miss Nangle, I said, is there a chance you would send me, you could talk the people here into sending me to Paris uh, to cover this? And uh, she said, well, I can try. She did talk them into it. And not only did she talk them into it, she called my mother in Nebraska to say that I would be traveling with a young man, a photographer from the Tribune. And would that be okay with my mother? And my mother said, uh, I trust my daughter. Yes. Well, not only did she trust me, she knew the young man. He was a friend. He was the reason I moved to the Tribune from the Des Moines Register. So it was funny. But imagine a boss today calling your mother. I mean, this just would not happen. These were the amazing things in my career that I, I really, they were gifts. So I did get to go to, you know, 
I covered the collection. Excellent, excellent. You have such a very, very interesting life and career history. Um, how did you end up in Los Angeles after, after working at um, the uh, newspaper? Uh, Des Moines Register. And the Des Moines Register uh, then. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, oh, this is another, only in America, only in Nebraska, only in Los Angeles. I was visiting my brother who lived in uh, California and we were in Los Angeles and we were like right in front of the Los Angeles Times. And he said, you know, why don't you move here? Why don't you get a job at the Times and we could see each other as it is. It, I never get to see you. And I said, yeah, I know that would be great. And he said, well, look, we're right here. Why don't you just uh, call and see if you someone could see you? And it's in the days of outside telephones. And so I called and I said, um, may I, this, my name is Mary Lou Luther. May I please speak uh, with your managing editor? And the woman on the telephone said, we don't have a managing editor. I'll put you through to the editor. And the editor was Nick Williams, um, St. Nick Williams. Uh, and he, I said, hi, Mr. Williams, thank you. I, my name is Mary Lou Luther. And he said, I know your name. And I thought, how in the world would he know? Well, he knew because um, at that moment, the Chicago Tribune was one of the few uh, newspapers that sold its color pages. It was one of the few newspapers who had color pages. And of course, the fashion pages were always in color. So he said, well, come on up. And I did. And uh, he hired me. <laughs> I mean, isn't this an amazing story too? It is, yeah. So I um, listened to some previous interviews that you did and have been reading some you know, online stories. And you spoke of being very intimidated when you first entered the fashion area. Can you talk okay. about that a little bit? Yes, of course. I was working for the Des Moines Register. And my boss there, Frank, Frank Ierly, uh, asked me to come and meet the fashion editor who was retiring. And uh, she was very knowledgeable about fashion. And uh, her aunt was Carmel Snow, the editor of Harper's Bazaar, and her uncle owned the paper. So she, we were together for two weeks. And it was at a time when the pictures from the Paris Haute Couture were coming in. And so she said, oh, this is great. You'll get to see this. Uh, she said, um, now this is Jacques Fat. And I thought, oh, she means Jacquees Fath. I mean, this is how dumb I was. And uh, she said, and then this is Christian Dior, and this is Dior's new tulip silhouette. And I, 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 I couldn't see a tulip in there for the life of me. And um, so I went to my boss, Mr. Ireley, and I said, you know, I, I can't be your fashion editor. I don't know a thing about fashion. And he said, you'll learn. And he said, I don't want to talk to you again until, uh, oh, let's say maybe three months. And um, he sent me, well, before that, I was working and at the paper, at do, trying to do fashion and getting more and more, oh, I thought, this is terrible. I have to get out of here. So I went to him and I said, you know, every day when I drive into the parking lot, I, I know that 5,000, no, 1,500, 1,250 people. Oh, I think I've got this wrong. 1,535 people, which was the sign on the build on the side of the building. I know that all of these people know I haven't a clue about what I'm writing about. And I said, you know, it's embarrassing. I, 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 you either have to find me another place in at here or I've just got to resign. And that's when he said, you're not resigning. So he sent me to New York. And in those days, Eleanor Lambert was uh, um, 
the leading um, she had the leading PR company, and she organized a, a fashion week where you, the only people you saw were her clients. And you, she, you sat at the the nicest hotel in New York, um, surrounded by all sorts of good things to eat, and uh, just sat there and watched the clothes go by. So. Uh, I, when I got back and told Miss Nangle about it, she said, well, that's terrible. You, this is awful. You, you were looking at her client's clothes two months after they were shown to buyers. And I said, yeah, that's true. And she said, well, that would be like telling a sports writer that they can't cover the World Series until two months after it had happened. We can't do that. So she, amazing woman that she was, organized, I think at one time there were four other papers and we could, wouldn't go to Eleanor Lambert shows. We went with the buyers. Unfortunately, in the beginning, I remember signing in, they asked you to sign in in those days um, at one firm and I got M-A-R-Y-L and they said, are you Mary Lou Luther? And I thought, oh my God, what have I done? And they they said, I'm sorry. And I said, yes, I am. Is there a problem? And uh, they said, well, we're sorry, we can't let you in. Ellen, we're a client of Eleanor Lambert, and she asked us not to let you in. And I said, okay. <laughs> so that was her strength. I mean, she was amazing. And she was a big force in the, the CFDA is the Council of Fashion Designers of America. And all the leading American designers, of course, belonged. So about three designers agreed to see us, but we grew and eventually we won. <laughs> wow. Wow. Those are you, your perseverance is so evident <laughs> yeah is it yes at 92 i'm still persevering <laughs> so and as you tell that i mean i believe that your story <clears throat> in your profession probably rings true to some other people and what they've done and how they felt like they may have to break a stereotype like who from nebraska would know about fashion or um, you're too young to do your job or, you know, yeah. looking back over that career, do you have recommendations for people who are trying to become successful in a career when others think they're not qualified? What, what, what keys to success would you offer when you're at that stage where you're trying so hard? Uh, I guess I would offer my services. Um, I would say, you know, would you try me? I'll work for nothing for a month or so and just see how it goes. I think that would be good advice. And then I used to give this advice in my clothes lines column. When you have a new job, I said, uh, don't buy any new clothes in fashion until you see what your boss is wearing. And then go that route. And then I thought today, oh my God, that wouldn't hold for one minute. <laughs> you can wear whatever you want to wear to work, uh, or at least you couldn't tell a few minutes ago. <laughs> anyway. Right. Well, and then I, I wonder if you have to be careful that you don't outdress your boss, maybe. Too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. But now I don't think that's true. I think anything goes. And um, and I also think that people, that bosses are so schooled in not getting into trouble by demeaning those who work for them and other things <laughs> uh, that it just wouldn't work. So over your career, what changes have you seen in the fashion industry? in general, what, what monumental things stick in your mind? Well, 
it, it, I, I'm going to refer in my book to my one of my, uh, I think one of the most amazing quotes in the book is from a very famous French designer, André Courrèges. I brought it uh, on a piece of paper here because may I read it? Please do. And I think, is that the one you want, Teresa, to show the picture? Did In the book? Yes, you, yes, yes, yes. So could you... While Mary Lou's getting ready, Sydney, could you put Spotlight Teresa so people can see that? Hold on. There we go. Okay. Andre Grej quote says, <clears throat> major trends which impact society for seven years or more always begin after a major calamity or scientific breakthrough. Fashion flowered in the 30s following the stock market crash. Christian Dior's new look of 1947 emerged after World War II. The youthquake of the 60s followed the introduction of the pill. And, pa and the pants revolution followed man's landing on the moon. That was 1969. Following the Courage cause and effect example, we should now be two years deep into the next big fashion moment. But what is that moment? Is it caution, comfort, historical repeats, multi-sexual clothes, minimalism, maximalism, artificial intelligence, outer space, Hollywood? It's right now, there is no one look. And uh, it says so much about our fashion to me, always interests me because fashion is, uh, illustrates its time. And you can, I can tell looking at clothes, oh, that's from the 60s or 70s or whatever. And uh, I just think this is the disruption that is today. And everyone is kind of searching and that's why I think the quotes in the book are really so amazing because some of the famous designers are saying, well, I think maybe there's too much change in fashion. We need to just settle down for a while. And another one will say, you know, that's why I love it when the designers themselves speak out because in fact, I have a word for it in the book. I call, it, I call this book a fashion word robe. And you're supposed to laugh, as my husband would say, you hear the applause. <laughs> I think everybody is. Uh, that is that's a lovely quote. Okay. Thank you. Um, when we first started to talk with you, Mary Lou, you talked about your 10 most outstanding fashion moments. Yes. Is there any that you'd like to share today? Ooh, there's a lot. Uh, let's see. Well, I'd like to share this one. Uh, this happened when I worked at uh, the Los Angeles Times. Um, Edith Head, um, in case you don't know the name, Edith Head was uh, a famous Hollywood costume designer. Costume designer. Um, she won eight Academy Awards. No one has come close uh, since. So I went to interview her. And she was in one of the, the trailers that they would take on sets or to be near the set. And um, I was seated there and in front of me uh, were Edith's, Edith's eight Academy Awards. And when she came out, she said, I do that on purpose because they, I make them wait a while if a, like they being the actress. And uh, they, after looking at those eight Academy Awards, they they can't say, now look, Edith. And she said, so it was intimidating, but it helped me. And the reason she told me that story, another reason, I was having, we became great friends. I was having lunch with her and I was mad at the LA Times because the food department had eight people and I only had in the fashion department four people. And I said to Edith, you know, this is just not right at all. And she said, well, just stop it right there. Do not whine. 
You're never going to get anything by whining. Now, what you need to do is convince them that uh, in order to help the um, Los Angeles Times really make use of all of the people waiting to advertise there, uh, you need more help. And you, the, you, if you would give a little more coverage to fashion, I'm sure it would pay back in advertising. And they did, and it did. <laughs> and Edith was right. She's amazing. One of those great helpers along the way, right? Oh, my <laughs> God. Absolutely. Since you mentioned um, the LA Times again, would you tell the story of um, your mother being a support to you and then the result of a visit that she had to you in Los Angeles? But I think I did. Well, that was before the session started, though. So the okay. audience has <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, um, European designers, when they came to America, usually just came to New York. So the few that did uh, called the Los Angeles Times. We were the only newspaper. Well, that's not true. There was another. Oh, my God, that's not true. Uh, but anyway, they called me. And uh, almost every one of them would say, you know, I, I really want to meet Edith Head. And uh, so I would take them to meet her. She was always charming, uh, couldn't have been nicer. And um, now wait, tell me where I was. But we were going to uh, speak to the, the impact your mother had on you and your mother meeting yeah oh, okay yes thank you thank you um my mother was um well in in addition to being a saint <laughs> she was remarkable she was visit, visiting us in los angeles and claude montana the famous french designer uh came to our home and uh, my mother was there visiting, and he, as he left, uh, as I, as he left me at the front door, he said, "I want you to know that your mother is the chicest woman I have ever met." And I thought, "Oh my God, that is amazing!" And for Cambridge, Nebraska, <laughs> she was chic and, That's a nice and very, very, very sweet too. And she was. I'm not familiar with this, but uh, Teresa mentioned she was a great support to you to go to the university. Yeah, oh yes. She uh, was head of the library um, and she invited the head of the University of Nebraska, uh, what was it called then? Um, well, it, it related to books and fashion. I'm sorry, I can't think of the name. So this woman came to Cambridge and there wasn't any place for her to put her up. So she stayed with us and uh, she was totally responsible for my wanting to go to the university. She was a, a, a force. Um, she told me all about what could happen to me at the university and why it would be important to go. And I, I was in such awe of her and had such respect for her. I thought, well, boy, if, if she recommends this, I'm going. <laughs> and that really moved me to want to go to the University of Nebraska. I wish I could think of her title. She was in charge of all the books that the university published and more. <laughs> well, thank goodness to your mother for getting that started. Yes, it exactly. has certainly made a big impact worldwide. Her, you know, she never thought what she was encouraging you to do. Uh, right. She just wanted to do what would be best for me. So um, you <clears throat> had mentioned in some notes to me about Andre. Well, Andre is the one who Teresa was holding the book up, right? But yeah. you also noted that he was the first designer to hire Black models. Can you African-American models? Uh-oh, we lost your... Yes, the first... 
That's all right. Anyway, it was Pierre Cardin and uh, another just amazing force in fashion. Well, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe it was Courage. Do you have those notes or anything? This is a note that you had sent me. You had Andre Courage, the first designer to hire Black models. But okay, he it, was. do you remember then, at that period of time? Could you tell us anything uh, about how that came about, even if we don't have the right designer? <laughs> No, it, uh, it was Andre Koresh. Um, I think designers um, long ago discovered that the show uh, is almost as important as the clothes. Fa when I started, fashion was uh, three things. It was color, fabric, and shape. Today, it is so much more. And one of them is the show. Um, so when he uh, shows the black models, that was, uh, you know, unheard of. That never happened before. And, and he just did it. Uh, I, I don't know how to explain why he did it, but he did it. And it did create uh, a lot of talk. And, and it uh, also made other designers feel, oh, I can do that. You know, why don't I do that too? <laughs> I'll hire a whole team of Black women, you know, and they did. Excellent. And then you also spoke of Rudy Gernrich. Gernrich, right. And it, um, he had some very interesting tactics for yes. his shows. Yes. I uh, Let me tell you about Rudy Gernrich. Um he uh, escaped the Anschluss with his mother, and they didn't know where they were going, but they were uh, headed out of Germany, and they wound up in Los Angeles, and Rudy, in the beginning, was a dancer, uh, quite a famous dancer, and then he decided to design clothes. And I, I love his quote in the book. Readers, if you have the book, be sure to read the Rudy Gernrich quote. It was, uh, he made the point that until the 60s, fashion always lived within its time. And, uh, but in the 60s, it all started in London with the mods and the rockers. They were these young people that wore minis. No one had ever shown their knees before, let alone their thighs. Uh, and it, it just encouraged a whole change in how we look at clothes. It was the first generation where uh, the young women were not dressing like their mothers. They were dressing like they wanted to dress. And um, again, I would attribute part of that to the pill, uh, the, th the changes in technology that encouraged such behavior, not behavior, but anyway, it was a, a great period and Rudy took it several steps further. At one of his shows, he passed out guns at one of his shows, he had it in a, a department store and had the models come down the escalator. Uh, in 1970, he decided to take two models to Japan to, uh, it was called Expo 70. And he shaved their bodies, hair, even pubic hair, and um, created, uh, you know, <laughs> to, to say the least, a mild sensation. And then he created uh, what he called, or what people then called the poo bikini. It was the topless, the topless bathing suit. And uh, that indeed too, that had never been done before. When I wrote about that, that had never been done before, I got a call from a woman who said, you're wrong. It had been done before. I think Rudy took it right out of one of my art books. Someone had done that years before. And so I love it when people care enough to call and correct you. Oh, talking about that, can I tell a correction story? Please, please. Um, I was, no, wait, where was I working? Um, again, uh, at the Los Angeles Times. Um, 
I don't know how much the name um, Stan Herman means to you today, but at it, it, well, at, he came to Los Angeles. He was just beginning his career at Mr. Mort as a designer, and I was quite taken with his clothes. And I did a story about him, and he called me the next day and he said, "Did you have to say I'm short?" And I said. He said, I bet you don't say Hubert de Givenchy is tall. And I said, well, as a matter of fact, I have. He's six foot six. But he taught me a real lesson. His height had nothing to do with his talent. But then I, I kind of think I've turned it around in the book. He, I asked him to write the foreword because he, he's not just tall. He's a giant in fashion today. He's worked for QVC longer than anyone ever on the show. He has dressed more people, I'm sure, than anyone in the world because he's created uniforms for airlines. For I'm, He's just an amazing force. And he's now 94 and he plays tennis three times a week. Okay. <laughs> Wow. He's my hero. <laughs> wow. You know, so many interesting background stories. So we have a question. <laughs> question from the audience. Uh, do you have a favorite designer that you like to wear? And how has your style changed from when you first got into fashion until now? You're talking to the audience. This is a question from the audience to you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, say it again. Uh, do you have a favorite designer that you like to wear? Oh, okay. And has how has your style changed from when you first entered the fashion industry? Okay. Uh, yes, I have, uh, well, three favorite designers whose clothes I have worn almost exclusively at different times. Uh, the first would be Sonia Raquel, a French designer. She was the first to uh, take clothes and uh, inside out, and you could wear them on both sides. Uh, she was the first to write on clothes. She was the first to have her models, and in those days, well, today too, most of the models never smiled. Her models smiled, and in one show, she had them talking as they came down, describing their clothes. I mean, she was amazing. Then there was Jeffrey Bean. Jeffrey Bean, uh, I, I just think, was so much ahead of his time. And again, in the showmanship part, um, he once had a show where all the models were uh, ballerinas, and uh, that really changed a lot of the way people thought about clothes. He was the first designer to show in Europe, all over Europe. And um, he, uh, <laughs> my favorite quote from him ends with this one. Because he didn't, uh, John Fairchild was head of Women's Wear Daily, and that was like the Bible of the fashion industry in those days. Um, and he had asked Jeffrey to do something, and Jeffrey Bean didn't want to do it, so he didn't do it. From that day on, Jeffrey Bean was, no one could could write his name, could talk about him in Women's Wear Daily. And I'm sure it did hurt Jeffrey Bean's career. Uh, but uh, so anyway, uh, I asked him about it once, and he said, well, I, I now have a name for John Fairchild. It's John Unfairchild. <laughs> I love that. That was great. And my third would be Yoli. Uh, Yoli, uh, uh, Asian American, uh, her came comes from a family of architects, and she is a fashion architect. She's amazing. She can create things by placement from less fabric than any other designer I've ever known. She was just, well, like an architect. She created the, from space. Um, I, I don't know how to describe her, but 
she had the first fashion show in New York City in a subway. And all of the models were real people, one of whom was Elsa Clinch, who at that time was with CNN. She was, a, Elsa was the first major television, fashion television personality. So anyway, uh, Yoli is an amazing force. She still is. And uh, much of my wardrobe is hers. Uh, do I have a, the pants I'm wearing right now uh, are hers. This probably is too. I'd forgot to look at the label. <laughs> and uh, the same was true of Jeffrey Bean and the same was true of Sonia Raquel. Um, anyway, those three would be the, the my own personal wardrobe. It still is. And And has your style changed from when you started in the fashion industry until now? Oh, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, at first, um, well, Sonia was my first real idol in changing the way I looked. Um, until then, clothes were big shoulder pads and very masculine. That was the look. Uh, her clothes were all knits, all no shoulder pads, all very high armholes that showed every speck of your body. So it also made me diet <laughs> and try to get a better body for her clothes. And I once asked her, I said, she probably made me a black, uh, a person who still adores anything black, <laughs> including people. But anyway, um, she, I asked her once, I said, do you only always wear black? I always see you in black. And she said, uh, no, she said, you only see me in the winter. In the summer, I only wear white. And then she said, I'm a Gemini. You know, we have two faces, <laughs> white and black. <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely. Thank you, audience. You can keep sending questions in the chat to moderator Barbara Velasquez. Um, so we talked about your growth in fashion, but I can't leave the thought that you grew up in Cambridge, you moved to Lincoln, you spent some time in the Midwest, you went to LA, and now you're in New York City, and you've traveled the, across the world, right? Mm -hmm. um, how did you make successful adjustments to maneuver life in those different parts of the world? I guess by just looking and being aware of my surroundings and what would be appropriate for those surroundings and what would definitely not be at that time. Now, I don't think you could pick a thing that uh, is inappropriate, but those were different times. Okay. And every summer you come back to Cambridge? Yes. I do, and I uh, love it. I come back to the house I grew up in, and uh, my best friend, uh, we were, we've been friends since we were four. We played gin rummy together almost every afternoon. Uh, she, alas, right now is in the hospital in Cambridge. Um, she fell, but the good news is, this just happened. But the good news is uh, she just cracked ribs, not, she didn't break any bones, but she's, I mean, that's painful and she has to be there for a while. But anyway, um, I love being there. Uh, to me, it's very real. And New York is not real. <laughs> so when you get back to Cambridge this summer, besides seeing friends, is there any one special thing that you just can't wait to do or yes I can't wait to eat my friend's cinnamon rolls she makes the best cinnamon rolls you have ever tasted in your life and <clears throat> what she does now for me Donna uh, used to look after my house when I wasn't there now this woman does and she's absolutely great and her name is Becky Johnson and she and her husband live on a farm and just produce all sorts of wonderful things. But her cinnamon rolls, I freeze them 
just before I, I leave to return to New York and I divvy them out cautiously to special friends. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Um, I'm looking back over the questions. I want to make sure that we don't miss a good question to ask you. So I'm assuming that some of the designers you've interviewed are more fun maybe to work with than others. Yes. And uh, we're wondering if you if there's your a favorite that you had in terms of that working relationship. Several. <laughs> okay. Okay. So we don't need to know. But well, I, I should interrupt now and say uh, journalistically, especially the way the rules were when I was learning about journalism, you're not supposed to become friends with anyone you cover or with anyone you have to go back to cover. So I tried to keep relationships totally uh, just business. But then when they would invite me to their home for dinner, I thought, oh, I that I, I like to see how they live. That influences what they do. And so I started making my own rules, but I hopefully became still, I wasn't afraid to criticize. It sounds from what you said previously that you were, um, you were very good at taking criticism and using it. I hope so. Uh, yeah. Yes, I, I think you have to be uh, to be a, a good journalist. But journalism has so changed. When I grew up, it was every lead had to be who, what, why, when, and where. Sometimes how much or how many had to be. Today, you're lucky if it's in the sixth paragraph. <laughs> Today, even like the New York Times, uh, the writers. Um, I, I think they feel they have to give you a setting for the real news of the day. So I usually start reading the fashion stories in the New York Times. I start with the last paragraph because I know that's what really happened that occasioned this big story. And I like to know what occasioned it, you know. Excellent. That's very helpful. Do you have any recommendations for completing assignments with people who are more difficult to work with? Um, yes, uh, just keep your mouth shut and listen and write. Don't get into any uh, big arguments um, because they're just gonna close you off. Uh, feel free to say whatever you want, but don't um, attack them while you're there with them, you know, and make your your attacks on in print justifiable. And uh, or there's always a kind of a clause to say mm, something kind of forgive me if I say this or do you know what I mean? You don't have to be mean. So. You have an illustrious career and you could just be relaxing and doing nothing, but you took on this amazing bespoke, your book, your new book, bespoke. And Sydney can put up some slides for us. The official title is Bespoke Revelations from the World's Most Important Fashion Designers. Audience members, if you put your name in the chat, you could have a chance to win a copy of Bespoke. Great. Uh, um, Bill Cunningham was a great New York Times photographer, much more than a New York Times photographer. He was a fashion uh, god. And uh, we, had, you, we had worked together when I worked for the Chicago Tribune. And I knew him very well. He, uh, he would never take even a meal if you offered it. Uh, he, he was so uh, perfect. <laughs> and he always said to me, and every time he would see me, he would say, never stop working. And I do think it's good advice. If you can work, 
uh, I say keep on working because it gives you um, another side of life and a reason for being on this planet. Uh, just, I think not working is a real setback to a lot of older people who, who should have stayed on, you know, if they could. Thank you. Or start writing books. <laughs> So can you tell us, as Sydney's going to move through the pages, tell us why you wanted to write this, put together this book, and what people could expect if they pick up a copy? Okay. Well, I, I hope they can expect that des I'm giving designers a voice. And uh, their voices are, are worth hearing. They have a lot of very interesting things to say. Um, uh, now, some of the clothes are, as you can see, uh, exaggerated, uh, but they're not all like that, and all the quotes are not like that. Um, it, it's just, um, it intrigued me to know more about what they thought about the world um, and, and their their views of fashion were, uh, I always look for the creative side. I didn't care to look at a man tailored suit again, but they're very popular right now. And uh, I, I do think that the expression that the past is always present is true. Even for those who belittle looking back, it's just there, uh, it's our heritage. Well, and that's what they call some of those clothes, heritage. And Mary Lou, tell us a little bit about your illustrator. Oh Ruben. my gosh, Ruben. Ruben Toledo uh, is an artist beyond compare. Um, he can do anything and with a smile, he's one of the nicest human beings you will ever meet. Uh, his wife, Isabel, uh, was a designer. She died about three years ago. They grew up in Cuba. They were childhood friends. And I always thought that they're more like brother and sister. They were just inseparable. They almost had the same mind. And Ruben's work is, uh, he made the book. If, if the book was just those quotes, I, I doubt that few people would care, but to see, and that's Ruben, but to see his renditions of those clothes is, is such a joy. Uh, do you have more of the clothes to show? I think that's all we were allowed to show by the publisher. Okay, sorry. But, but there's, you know, they're beautiful. They're all beautiful. Yes, they are. Or if they're not there, uh, you're showing, why are you showing these clothes? You know, <laughs> they're outrageous too. <laughs> it's a lovely book. So thank you for those of you who put your name into the chat. I've yeah. copied those. And then um, we do, we have another question that's come in. What was one of the biggest obstacles you faced when developing your career? Uh, early on, it would have been, um, I had no background in, in fashion. That was an obstacle that I had to learn to overcome if I was going to work in the field of fashion. Uh, other obstacles, well, being a woman wasn't always easy. Um, women in journalism got, uh, you either worked in the food department or the uh, any department that wasn't very important. Uh, the men always got the exciting jobs. So there was that. I, I liked staying in fashion, so that never really bothered me. I wasn't a victim, but I saw a lot of victims who should have had jobs that didn't because they were women. We here have talked about how in the month of women's history, your story turns out to be a good one, right? 
you were stereotyped into a position. You tried to get out of it a few times, but it turned out to work for you. And we're so thankful. Yes, indeed. Your I life am. was fulfilled and you, help, you have done so much. Um, well, I have had such great leaders. I have been gifted with my bosses. I mean, no one could have had the bosses I have had. They were amazing. They always helped me. Well, I want to thank you so much, Mary Lou. Do you have any final thoughts or quotes that you'd like to share with the audience before we move to our closing slides? One of his best quotes, if I told a joke and it didn't register, he would say, you hear the applause. <laughs> I like that. You hear the applause. <laughs> Those husbands, they're good. Uh, but uh, see, I think it just went over. Like he said, you didn't laugh immediately. <laughs> you know. So thank you. Thank you so, so very much. Um, I know in one of the interviews I listened to, you spoke to always wanting, understanding your responsibility to help others and always just wanting to be able to provide opportunities. And I wanna say that I, I can't speak, I can't know everybody's situation who's in the audience. You're kind enough to let us record this so people will continue to be able to learn from you. But I know you've helped people today. Well, I feel that's a, one of the major things I can do. Uh, I have a lot of contacts and, uh, you know, Bill Cunningham never stopped working. So I now I, I work a lot for other people free, of course. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. I will so take a free lunch. <laughs> when you are back in Nebraska, you need to let us know. Yes. And you'll give me a free eat, lunch. We will either invite you as you drive through Omaha, or I will come to see you in Cambridge. Come to see me in Cambridge. I, that would be great. I don't go through Omaha. Okay. Uh, that's, but... Well, we will connect. There are ways to connect, right? Yes. Okie doke. That would be great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> audience, both. audience members, again, your time is and your interest is so appreciated. I love to see your faces out there and um, thank you for honoring Mary Lou. And we see people clapping. That's wonderful. Yeah. Um, the questions you send also help to make this more interesting and beneficial for everybody. Sydney, let's put up the um, evaluation slide. And everybody, you can see in the chat, there is a link for the evaluation. We also have it there and it will be sent to you if we have a good email for you. And then I want to call your attention to two programs coming up next week on Wednesday, March 22nd at 2.30. Barbara McKillop Erickson, who is an adjunct professor at Nebraska Indian Community College, is going to tell her story of how she traveled to Germany with a team from Nebraska Indian Community College to help with the Omaha and Francis LaFleche exhibition. And that one will be available by Zoom if you would like to connect that way, but we're also gonna be in person at the Fort Omaha campus. And then on Thursday, this is a virtual only. We're really excited to have Olga Custodio, who's a retired Lieutenant Colonel from the US Air Force and also retired from American Airlines as a pilot. Her the title of her lecture is Querer is Poder. Olga fought and fought to become a pilot. Um, she tried to get in before the Air Force was allowing women to get in. Um, she has many firsts in her career. This is only virtual. So we hope you sign up for the Zoom and listen to her next Thursday. Thank you, Mary Lou, again. It was nice to be here. I loved it. Thank you to Teresa. I'd like to say thank you to Nick, Mary Lou's grandson, who helped us get things set up. And thank you to Walter, her son, um, who also helped us along with Sharon Lee, who can't be with us here today. Have a great day, everybody.